This is my talk about Colorhug Plus uh, Open Hardware Spectrograph. Uh, my name is Richard Hughes. Um, I am uh, work for Red Hat in the desktop group. I maintain uh, color management stuff in Linux, like ColorD, GNOME Color Manager, the color panel in the control center in GNOME. I've been working with open source software for about 10 years, using it for about 15 years. Um, so I've, I maintain loads of other stuff as well, like firmware stuff, power stuff, and all sorts of stuff. And Colorhug is really just a, a, a project that's got somewhat out of hand. Most people know the Colorhug as a, a display color emitter. Um, I asked my wife in 2011, I wanted to build something, about 50. So far we've sold, today we've sold the 3,000th and 82nd Colorhug, all still hand-built in London. So it's been massively more successful than we thought it would be. All these Colorhugs are made uh, at home. Uh, we've I used to build the, C the, P the PCBs myself as well. Now that's done by somebody else. But we still do all the assembly, the self-testing, uh, packaging, sending to the post office, returns, invoicing, tax, all of it ourselves. It's completely like a homegrown business. So you can see it's literally working out of a front room. Now I, now I have an office in the garden, which is slightly more swish. So color hug spectrum. Now I'm going to do like an introduction to color science in seven minutes. So this, is, this could be fun. So... A, sp a spectrograph is a device that measures, rather than the amount of red, green, and blue in an image, it's the device that measures all the frequencies in between in, in discrete bands. Uh, now, that's necessary because we don't use these anymore. These, like a CRT displays we all used to have, used to be fairly similar. So if you buy one CRT display, which would usually pretty much match another CRT display's color output, they'd be basically sRGB uh, modulo brightness which meant that we didn't have to do an amazing amount of color management to make images look the same on one display as another display. But then the future caught up with us, and we have wide gamut, uh, wide gamut displays, things like the dream color displays. We have OLED on our phones and tablets and stuff. And all of a sudden, you can take a photo now, and it looked completely different on one screen to another screen because of all the different um, the color capability of the screen. So you kind of have to do color management. Um, and and if you look at the, the actual the outputs of the devices that we're measuring, gone are the days where we can just assume everything's the sRGB. Colorhug 1 assumed that all the devices it was measuring were roughly sRGB, which became a problem as more and more devices deviated from that. So you can maybe see the gray line on the graph is an OLED uh, output of a mobile phone, which if you look at the mobile phone, all the colors are very high in contrast, very saturated colors. They sort of pop out at you, and it's great for marketing it looks really bad for showing realistic photos on. So we need to actually analyze the output of these devices so we can correct, it in a correct, uh, so we can correct the image in a, in a meaningful way. So this is a, a graph that will destroy any color scientist in the room. The, uh, the horseshoe graph on the left basically shows you an sRGB output, which is what you would find on a, most screens 10 years ago. And the one on the right is a, more, a wider gamma display on like a modern TFT panel, um, which basically if you try and squeeze all the colors on the right-hand triangle into the, the left-hand triangle, the spot colors are going to be different. So red hat red won't be red, won't be the correct red. IBM blue will look wrong. And so you have to do actual color management on devices because of the different gamut ranges. So this is what I really want to build. This is a, like an industrial spec. I think this is measuring paint for like a, a, for a, um, a, I think either a weapons or space program. This is a spectrometer, and it's basically uh, analyzing the, uh, the, the it's, it's just firing uh, uh, some light at a sample and seeing what bounces off. It's nothing more complicated. Realistically, this is what I'd like to be building. This is a lab uh, spectrometer, which will, it's this sort of thing you would find in a forensics lab. For instance, maybe analyzing blood or something like that. Um, about five, maybe $10,000. So it's an awesome bit of kit, but it's just too expensive for consumer uh, consumer use. And then there's a good old Color Monkey. Color Monkey is an awesome device. Um, it's, um, it's totally, uh, it's designed for a consumer. It's about 300 pounds. It's a really nice piece of kit with some really nice optics inside, but it's completely unfriendly for free software and free hardware. All the hardware inside is completely um, proprietary. Even the way of driving it, we have to reverse engineer. And with something like this, which is a, a precision piece of equipment, really, Reverse engineering a driver could mean that we're turning on the LED and literally burning the LED out, or powering on the CCD array and causing it permanent damage by 
trying to reverse engineer it. So it's not an easy thing to use. So I, I want to really build something that's as good as the Color Monkey in terms of um, performance and resolution for about the same price point, but have completely free software and completely free hardware. So after doing this talk a few times, people have said, but you know you can make a Spectro device using a bit of broken DVD and a webcam, right? And yeah, you can. You, you can actually use a broken piece of DVD and a high-resolution webcam for finding out the, like, uh, the absorption spectra of the sun or um, finding out emission spectra of a candle or something. And it, it's, it's a really good demo in a classroom, but it's completely unsuitable for creating an ICC profile. There's just not enough resolution, it's non-thermally stable, um, and it, it's, it's not precise enough. It's, it's non-linear in almost every respect. Um, so it's very, very difficult to get any meaningful results from this. So it's kind of discounted. The other issue with uh, trying to build a spectro is uh, people say, you, oh yeah, but you can go to a company like Hamumatsu where they will provide you a, a two centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter um, spectro device. Sure, but it only has a resolution of say 20 or 30 nanometers, which means when you try and measure a really spiky spectral output, like this is the red phosphor on a, on a CRT display, but CCFL backlights would be something similar as well. If, you've, if you're binning this into, say, 20 nanometer bands, you completely miss some of the spectral information, which makes the ICC profile you produce almost worthless. So actually, anything you need, the kind of the bare minimum for a spectral device is probably something like 5 nanometers for any kind of sensible results, which means discounting a lot of the commercially available um, inexpensive spectral devices that exist. Now, the other problem with uh, designing a, a, a spectro is you need to illuminate it. Now, Color Hug 1 and Color Hug 2 were simple color emitters. They measured the amount of green, blue, um, and red emitted from a source. But for something like paint or dye, um, paper, um, or wood, you need to actually shine an illuminant onto the sample itself to be able to <coughs> read a reading back, um, which is awesome because then all of a sudden you can have one device which can profile your um, display and can also profile your printer and paper combination as well. Then you start talking about illuminance. Now, illuminance is really just a posh source, a, a posh word for light source. Now, here you can sort of see there's the um, um, helium vapor light, um, which is making everything yellow and very sort of um, orangey. So it kind of so it shows that the illuminant can make the color look very different to what it actually is. And with modern LEDs, although the LEDs spectrally are still very spiky, actually this will have a much higher CRI index, i.e. how close it is to daylight, um, compared to a spiky illuminant like fluorescent. But it does make a difference if you're choosing paint colour and you know that it's going to be in a, a theatre like this with fluorescent lighting, you don't want to be choosing blue seat covers that look purple under the lighting that you're going to be using it in. So actually caring about the illuminant is important for measuring this stuff. So I don't have the ability to make a spectrograph myself. So I can make the electronics, I can do the software, I can do the packaging, I can do all of this, but I haven't got decades of experience in optical assemblies which would let me, which would let me build the, the spectrograph itself. So I've been asking other companies, this is a middle quote, this is a quote for just 10 units for £18,000, just for the actual optics itself. Now... Raising the order quantity does make this drop significantly, but you can see this isn't a small amount of money, and this is just a hobby. So this is the reason I've uh, been making a small amount of money on each Color Hug 2 sold, so I could fund the development for Color Hug Plus. And actually, even if I try and match the £300 RRP price of a, of a Color Monkey with a Color Hug Plus, I only make just under £15 on each one which is a tiny, tiny profit on a £300 device. This is after all the taxes and VAT and everything else is taken out. So there's actually a tiny, only a tiny amount of profit. So you have to sell an awful lot of Color Hug Pluses to make out your initial investment back. So it's, it's really... It, what I'm trying to express is this is basically a hobby. This isn't my professional business. There's no corporate backing for this stuff. It really is me standing there trying to produce something that's as good as a commercial product with basically no money. So... I launched Color Hug 2. Color Hug 2 was a uh, uh, successor to Color Hug 1. It went from using a, uh, a $2 sensor to a $15 sensor. And we're also trying out other stuff in the Color Hug 2 that we'll use for Color Hug Plus. Like this chip down there is a temperature chip, precision temperature chip, so I can do temperature 
um, temperature compensation of the sensor. Not so essential for Culhug 2, massively essential for Culhug Plus. It's a technical try. The top chip is a high-speed de-enable SRAM, um, because, I, for instance, for the Culhug 2, it will do display um, attack and decay and refresh rate calculations faster than USB will take the data, so we buffer them. For Colorhug Plus, it becomes essential for even sampling. We have to use the buffer as well. So it's a whole lot of technical things I've introduced early for Colorhug 2 that we're using occasionally, just so for Colorhug Plus we know it works. I've been prototyping Colorhug Plus for, um, I guess, a couple of years now, testing different ADCs, DACs, um, loads of different stuff. And I've found a design that will, I can produce which is good enough. There's no way I can make something that's going to be a lab-grade spectro, but I can do something that's good enough for an ICC profile. This was an original space prototype. The space prototype, um, this was originally using a, a crossed CT design, um, using a large optics element. This is just a, a space thing trying to work out where everything would go. We didn't go with this. We actually went with a much more expensive sensor with a, um, an optical um, a, a holographic linear array on it. Um, which is much more expensive, but much smaller, which meant I could reuse a lot of the, the um, tools I, make, I built for Colorhug 2, for Colorhug Plus. So this is the actual Colorhug Plus PCB. Um, this is one of the first prototypes that came out. It looks very, very similar to a Colorhug 2, with a few more holes, a few more chips. The digital side on one side is almost exactly the same, so I know the digital side works completely. The analog side is the other side, which is completely different to a Colorhug 2. And it's actually rammed just the same as the top of the, uh, of the, of, of the digital side is. I would have had color hugs pluses to show as prototypes, but I made a small mistake with the analog design involving a, a difference of opinion with voltages and me and, and a vendor. So I have to, I have to re spin the analog side um, before I can actually get some prototypes out. But we're really close. The physical design is very, very similar to uh, color hug 2 in that there's a foam pad at the top, slightly thicker. Uh, uh, ABS lid, the, there's a, a glass, a circular piece of glass with a reflective coating on, there's a 3D printed element, there's a sensor itself, uh, there's the PCB with two illuminants, the incandescent illuminant which provides a wideband illuminant, like the sun, like CRI 100, and there's also a UV source as well, which allows us to do things like, um, for instance, like paper has a coating on it that fluoresces under UV light, which makes the paper look more blue than it would do otherwise, which makes your eyes get tricked into thinking it's brighter white, which looks awesome when you look at the paper, but then you print stuff and the print looks wrong because you haven't taken into account the, the, uh, the, the uh, fluorescence of the paper. So we have to use the extra luminant, which we can switch in, which the color monkey can't do, um, so we can work out how much of that um, um, is fluorescing. And then a simple case. And that kind of fits together really well. Um, it was, it was tricky. The 3D uh, part actually shields the sensor the, um, shields the sensor from stray light internally, and the internals are completely matte black as well. So for the finished article, it looks almost identical to a Color Hug 2 in size, slightly deeper. This allowed me to reuse all like, the existing tools I built for like punching the USB hole, the status LED, um, and um, it means I, the NRE is kept to an absolute minimum. This is my prototype that's sitting at home. Um, the, um, the glass with the reflective coating, the 3D element, the optical assembly, which on its own, I think it's about £140 when you buy 100 of them at a time, so it's kind of expensive, and the digital side finished, some screws in the lid. Ignore the quality of the cutting, this is me just hacking up for a demo. Um, the finished one will have a beautiful interved curved surface. Uh, and the optical assembly, uh, the uh, 3D printed bit will have like a nice uh, matte um, f flat finish rather than the moment. But it kind of shows that it does all fit in the box and it kind of works. So all of this stuff is completely open hardware and open source. The firmware itself, GPLv2 Plus, um, is written um, for the XC8 compiler. I'd love to use SDCC, the free compiler, but it's does, it miscompiles the code. When it's better, I'll switch to that. The model itself is written in OpenSCAD, uh, which is again open in a CERN license, and the hardware, itself, and the hardware um, is written in GDA tools like PCB and GSCEM, which is again all um, CERN or GPL v2+. So it's completely open source. Now, this is my current plan. So Colorhug 1, we've phased that completely. I think there's one left in stock in case anyone desperately needs one. Colorhug 2, we phased in the uh, end of 2015. 
and we're still selling. Colourhack ALS is an ambient light sensor that I designed mainly for the kernel hackers, um, so they could have a, a device for testing the kernel stuff and the user space uh, bits that sit on top. But we're still selling it as a, a, as a crude ambient light sensor, mainly um, monochrome. And Colourhack Plus, which I'd wanted to bring in, like I wanted to actually bring it and sort of bring it up to speed last year, but I kind of prioritised uh, putting a roof on the house and we've got a three-year-old little girl, so I kind of prioritised being a dad, then Red Hat, then Colour Hug, which I think is probably a, a sane thing to do. So Colour Hug Plus will definitely happen, but probably not quite this year, maybe end of this year. Uh, that's my talk. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, and I've got five minutes left for questions. Thank you.